loud. Um, all right, so you know how to run a PC, right? Yeah. So you can find that disk somewhere. Because it'll take me half an hour to do it. Anyway, he's a good guy, very active. You're, you're doing like a session at ACS and things, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So there's so, two yeah. sessions at ACS. So, so anyway, your, your yeah. talk and or your session and then a biomembrane stuff. Yeah, so he's like super active and good guy to hear some He's an expert at this stuff. So I'm not. So it's, it's, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. No, it's great to be here. So, so yeah, I, I uh, came out of Oak Ridge National Lab. So after my PhD, uh, and I was actually doing conducting polymers work at University of Texas and then ended up at Oak Ridge National Lab for six years or something. Far too long for a postdoc, but I was doing well and things were going well. And, money. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it was kind of nice. Uh, but then actually my wife got a job here with Proctor and fortunately I was able to, to manage a position here. Uh, and so I've been here five and a half, six years now. And Yes, I got a, a career award. We have some money from DOE still for biomembranes work, uh, ACS, PRF, and um, a couple of little corporate things. Uh, this was actually... It's a, how big is your group? So right now it's uh, Ayo and uh, Yashmitha and Luke and uh, Neji. So four PhD students right okay. now. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's growing. Growing, and growing. I mean, I think you could be a maybe a group eventually. I, I hope it. not. <laughs> I hope not. I I think I think you know this is maybe one postdoc on top of this would be wow. great for me uh, in the long term. I, I I don't think I could be spread that thin. Right. Um, but but anyways, um, this work came out of a NSF grant that I had with Professor Angelopoulos and Sergei Vesenko at the University of Florida in my first few years here. So I was a collaborator on this grant. And what we were looking at uh, was really the diffusion of acetone and water in Nafian. So this is the application of inelastic scattering to that, um, but this is coupled with pulse field gradient NMR work. So that was the sort of the heavy lift in this set of experiments, um, but my research uses these inelastic scattering techniques to look at things like the dynamics of biological membranes. So inside a cell membrane, the lipid molecules are diffusing around. They're also fluctuating uh, in three dimensions, right? And so those undulations tell you about the bending properties of the membranes. So by measuring molecular motions, you can imply bending properties in cell membrane. You can also look at the diffusion of substances like acetone and water uh, and compare that to the dynamics of polymers and things like a hydrogel. So that's another direction that we're looking at, or the diffusion of macromolecules themselves, like a protein in water. And that, that has interesting physics as it becomes more of a crowded system. Um, yeah, and then we also look at just some basic um, molecular motions of hydrogen bonding liquids. So water is a hydrogen bonding liquid. Um, we, if we think about where does the viscosity of a liquid come from, you can think about this as a structural rearrangement. So if you take sort of the green Kubo approach to that, you think about a liquid, if you took an instant snapshot, there's some sort of a percolated network that uh, resists compression, right? So that shear stress is actually a resetting or the resetting of the shear stress network could be understood to be the relaxation time of the system. So if you look at the correct relaxation time, you could understand what the time scale of the resetting of the network is, and that would give you a relationship between sort of the elastic modulus at inf infinite frequency versus the relaxation time of the network. So if you understand that for a hydrogen bonding system, then maybe we can generalize some rules for that kind of a thing. So that's the other project I'm working on. Okay. So dynamics in polymer system. So molecular relaxations within polymer systems controls all of the physical properties, right? So the diffusivity within the network, the viscosity and mechanical properties of the, of the material itself, aging and fatigue. So slow relaxation processes, the untangling of networks or of interconnections uh, can lead to aging and fatigue. Uh, conductivity, right? So if you're thinking about polymer batteries, 
the, the conductivity is directly coupled to the diffusivity. So if you have ions in a polymer matrix, they have to diffuse through the matrix to carry charge. That means that the polymer dynamics control the conductivity. Okay, so all of these things make that concept really important. And so there's a range of experimental methods that we can use to study polymer dynamics. Uh, here, we're just showing sort of a superposition of all of them. And the key point here is that these inelastic neutron scattering methods hold, at least in my myopic view here, uh, a very central role in understanding the sort of nanosecond, picosecond uh, time scale, say femtosecond to microsecond, if we're being generous. Uh, and angstroms to hundreds of nanometers length scale. So there's a time and length scale superposition, right, for measuring dynamics. So dynamic weight scattering in microns and uh, milliseconds or something? Generally, yeah. Okay, so let's see, how does that work in your part? <laughs> oh, how do you convert that to uh, memory electron volt? Right, so there's DLL. It's not there, right? Yeah, I didn't like Okay, so oh, seconds is 10 to the fifth and length scale, yeah, something on the order of 10 to the minus six, 10 to minus nine. So you're looking at much higher or higher energy. Higher energy, so faster dynamics and, and side? shorter distances. Oh, that's, that's Q at the bottom? Or? So this is, oh, is this is Q, right? Okay. And meters is, no, Q's at the top, so meters is here. Okay. I never saw that that put on this plot, you know, so that's why I have yeah. this there. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty so, so the idea um, that he's getting to here is that when you're doing a scattering process, the wavelength of the incident radiation is important, right? So it's actually determining uh, the time and length scale that you're probing. So when you get a scattering event, the, the wavelength of light is what? Hundreds of nanometers that gives you kind of a limiting resolution to your scattering process. Now, the incident, if you use thermal or cold neutrons, the wavelength of those particles is on the order of half a nanometer, something like that. So you can really tighten that up and increase the resolution of the scattering process. Okay, so wait, no, so the light has a much larger wavelength, mm -hmm. the smaller size, because the spin echo is, is, isn't really using the wavelength of the neutron, right? No, it's, it's not. Uh, it's using spin. Yeah. But it, it still determines Q. That's the problem. So the length scale of the process, so we'll get to this in a second. Neutron spin echo is a different way of encoding the velocity of a neutron, where you use opposing magnetic fields to essentially reset the procession of a of oh, a neutron spin. Yes, yes. Okay, all right, now I understand what's going on here. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So so it is to the left. So yeah. Kind of the Q scale almost. Yeah. So Q is at the top. Oh, I see. Um, all right, that's why. All right. Yeah, he's at the top. Sorry. So Q is the scattering wave vector. Uh, if we I don't know if we covered that, but yeah. Q is scattering wave vector. So Q is really limited by that wavelength, right? Q and wavelength are inversely related to each other. So the reason that spin echo is so limited, even though you can you can detect extremely small changes in the velocity of the neutron, you're still limited to the scattering wave vector for the length scale of that motion. So, so length and energy are related, but the two energies are kind of different. The one is the uh, loss energy, and the other one is kind of the elastic, or the size scale of energy or something, right? So, or it's a so energy is just really the velocity change right, in the scattering. For, for neutron scattering, when we think about what's the energy of a certain motion, it's really the momentum change, the velocity change of that neutron, which you can connect through the Planck constant. Energy and time are superimposable through the Planck constant for a scattering process. Where, where is some um, X ray? Like, so X-ray spectroscopy at the top. So X-ray for the oh, I see. I see. X -ray scattering. I see. All right. It's all there. It's all there, but it's all fast. It's so X-ray scattering is really good. Well, it. this is a neutron paper. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're focusing on the neutrons here. Um, so X-ray is going to be much higher energy and much and kind of smaller, smallish size. Yeah. Well, okay. 
So there are some x ray methods. Those are like kind of filler particles. Right. And so those are x ray photoelectron or x ray DCS, so photoelectron spectroscopy. Now, the problem with x rays generally for those kinds of methods is that x rays are destructive, whereas neutrons are not. So x rays, you know, you basically you start off with a nice clean polymer sheet after about half a microsecond or microsecond of x ray radiation. You tend to have a little black spot on your clean polymer sheet, right? You cook it, you damage it, you change it. Uh, neutrons do not do that to your sample. There's going to be a they just make it radioactive. They just make it radioactive. Uh, a very very small percentage of the atoms in your sample will absorb and neutrons. And they cost ten thousand times more money. <laughs> this is also true. Uh, so X rays in general, if you can do your experiment with X rays, do it with X rays, right? They're way easier to access. They're far more. The flux is like five orders of magnitude higher at least. Um, and again, they're accessible all over. You can do it with light. Do it light. You can do it with X rays. Do it with X rays. Neutrons are really uh, the specialist tool, uh, and there are some special rules that we'll get to in a second about what makes them so useful. Uh, but okay, so all these are available at Oak Ridge, right? All those techniques. Uh, X rays less no, 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 but no, uh, micro or yeah, NMR is I, no, I mean, just the color depends. Oh, yes, yes. So at Oak Ridge, they have an imaging beam line, three sands beam lines, two refract uh, reflectometers, three or four diffractometers, one spin echo, one backscatter, and about five. Time of flight instruments and so you write a, you write a proposal and then like you just get time there and mm -hmm. when you talk to the instrument scientist first. Yeah, so we can we can jump to that. Uh, the 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 game for getting access to these instruments is you write a user proposal. To prepare a user proposal, you should have a good idea what you want to be doing, and then write to one of the instrument scientists. So if you go to their website, each of these instruments will have two or three staff members associated. And you just want to get on the phone with them, have an email exchange, whatever it is, just get their feedback on, hey, is this a practical idea? Uh, if I was to do it, how would that actually look? Uh, and then you'll craft a two-page proposal that is a call twice a year at either Oak Ridge National Lab or NIST, NCNR, uh, in Washington, D.C. Oak Ridge is in Tennessee. Uh, and you'll just simply apply for beam time. And my experience, a well-written proposal, you'll never have to submit it more than twice. Yeah, uh, they're oversubscribed. You can drive a car to both places. Yeah, yeah. You don't necessarily have to fly. No. So. Uh, now, there is going to be an issue with neutron access in the next, let's say, year and a half. So NIST is still shut down. Uh, they had sort of a terrible accident of vaporizing some fuel, um, which is not a good thing to do. Uh, but supposedly they'll come back from that. The problem was that they were also scheduled to have a moderator upgrade simultaneously, like now. So they were supposed to shut down anyways right now to upgrade their moderator. So when they generate neutrons, you need to thermalize the neutrons to the correct temperature. And so you pass that through a little box of cryogenic hydrogen, and they're switching that over to deuterium. Mm -hmm. So now it's going to have a higher... Flux essentially. There'll be less absorption in that sense. It's time in Europe too, right? That's, this is where I was going. So there's there's also instruments. Yeah. Either partner in the UK or in France or, or Switzerland or whatever. Yeah. And, Germany, then, yeah. and you just get in. And you get in. And, and it's, they pay, like sometimes you can get money from them to pay for the flight too. For yeah. Example. So the, the Europe. Is like. <laughs> it is that. Yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. The food's better. The food's much better. Uh, so the European system, it tends to be a little different. So there's there's neutrons in Japan, there's neutrons in Australia, there's neutrons outside of Guangzhou now, but I don't think anybody can access. Um, but they're, so that's they're not a very powerful source. Sometimes, like the Chinese, they're pretty hot on bringing Americans in to use. They'll just run the stuff for them. Yeah, yeah. I think. But sometimes it's still still work. <laughs> so I, I, the only person I know there is is Rosie. Uh, Oh, I don't even know properly. She was one of uh, Xiao Chen Chen's students, and she was at Wayne State. And she now runs their spin echo program. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to build the spin echo. But the problem is that the Chinese source is only like a tenth as powerful as the Oak Ridge source. And the Oak Ridge spin echo is 
dicey to begin with. So I, I think it's an inappropriate instrument to build on that source, but I think it's a technological stand-up kind of thing. So there's a reason that they would build it, but it's not a practical instrument. So SANS is great there, but other things less so for it's certainly for inelastic scale. Yeah. Korea doesn't Korea have a Korea collaborates with JPARC there. Oh okay. okay. So JPARC is the Japanese source. The European system, sorry, that is the way that that is funded is partnerships between countries. So every country gets their little slice of allocation. And so it's not really an open competition based on the quality of your proposal. If you're not European, you don't get access, period, the end. If you can partner with the European scientist that has such access or can put in for such access, then they basically get everything paid for because the government's already buying a piece of the time. So it's just a different mechanism. Um, for the way that, that they allocate being done. It's it's kind of a shame that the U.S. is the only, the U.S. neutron system is the only open application system in the world, which means we fund the whole thing, and then we have not whole access. It's kind of frustrating. Um, but we definitely get good science. Then. So anyways, in the next couple of years, Oak Ridge is also shutting down for a power upgrade because they're going to try to build a new source. So they're going to upgrade one of their two sources. There's two sources at Oak Ridge, a place called Hyfer, which is a, a reactor source, and a place called the SNS, which is a spallation source. Um, the spallation source will be down for the next, I don't know, eight, nine months or something, because um, they're going to upgrade the proton accelerator at the front end of it to try to have higher power. So the time of flight, so the explanation of the time of flight, why is it, it's better for this technique, right? For yes. Some reason. Why is that? What's that reason? So, I mean, it's going to be a lot more complicated to analyze the time of flight data, right? Well, here's, so, so each pop, okay. each pop every, every Let me, of a second or something, you get the full spectrum, the detector has to time it out, and then you can enter it into the wavelength. Yes. So, 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 it's a nightmare. It, it, for, for, for time of flight and backscattering, it's the background it, changes with wavelength too. So, and the absorption factor changes with wavelength. So, everything changes with wavelength. Scattering factor. Yes. And, but, right. but, so for time of flight and backscattering, it is vastly superior, vastly superior for spallation. Um, for spin echo, it's horrifically worse. For sand, it's horrifically worse, right? Yeah. So it's 20 years worse. No, it's yeah. if you build an instrument on a reactor, it runs in a year. You build a ventilation, 20 years later, it'll run <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, well, but so again, the, the inelastic instruments that are just time of flight based are vastly superior. Like by the time they shut down uh, the thing at Argonne, it was running perfectly well, you know. <laughs> that was like about twenty-five years. I ago. yeah, that, that was, was a fun thing. That was that was Al Gore, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so let me let me go back um, to make sure I've covered everything I wanted to talk about here. All right, so for polymer dynamics, though, the the, the point here is. There are different time scales or sort of different hierarchies in polymer dynamics. You have side chain relaxations, you have main chain relaxations. Um, yeah, you know, you then you can get all the way down to vibrational modes where you can have diffusion of molecules through the polymer, like a plasticizer or a solvent. Do you right. find that there's a lot of uh, BS in this? Like, you know, people publishing papers that are totally like they ignore facts about stuff. And and stop matter in particular, not your paper, but <laughs> paper this year. It seems pretty interesting. And it's like, but then you look at it, and they did well, they do a network like relaxations of special networks, like gel uh, PL network, uh -huh. kind of some of your stuff. But they didn't bother to say, like, well, when you stretch it, like the thing relaxes, right? So yeah. You're gonna run this for like two or three hours. And they it held it stress. It, it, it aging or they they never checked, you know, yes. stress. Is there any like there, there, there is a stuff. tendency. There is a tendency there's for no one people. understands what you're doing in this field. Exactly. For the most part. Most people don't get checked. I mean, they understand a little bit to be dangerous. And then like it seems like it's a lot of room to play in this. Yeah. This is true. Um mm -hmm. the, the like that paper could have been rejected by like at least 10 different angles. And, 
And yeah, it was when you're reviewing this field, it is difficult, right? Yeah. Because there are some practicalities for these experiments that we should talk about, which is they take a long time. So typically a measurement, like a backscattering measurement that I'm making that we'll talk about for this paper that I'll talk about here, those were probably four hour collections. Now, in the case where you just got a piece of polymer that's sort of not doing anything, it's just sitting at a certain temperature at a certain hydration content in a sealed container, that's okay, right? You're looking at steady state self-diffusion, fine. Uh, if the system is being probed and you're purporting to represent that in the data, well, are you really representing that through the whole time course of your collection? Probably not. Um, so you have to be careful with that. And you should at least discuss it. Yes, I, mean, I agree. I, I, I can understand that it's difficult to do the measurement, but to not discuss the problems. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you, I mean, I've, I've tried these extension measurements yeah. before. It, it's challenging, right? I mean, you've yeah, got to collect it's back. It's worth doing. It's definitely interesting. You know, we basically got to be a little realistic, at least lie about it. Yeah. But to not discuss it is kind of like. Well, I mean, usually you would find some sort of hand waving argument to say, yeah. that, well, it's okay, I mean, it's, it's still representing something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Anyway. So, okay. The, the point though is different types of dynamics have a different characteristic time scale. Okay. And what you really need to do when you're studying polymer dynamics is match up the method you're using to the time scale and length scale of the motion you care about understanding. And so if you care about diffusion through a substrate, well then backscattering is where you wanna be. Because if you're looking at characterizing a diffusion coefficient, um, you know, for motions happening on the order of a nanometer and time scales on the order of picoseconds, tens to hundreds of picoseconds, Backscattering is exactly what you want. But if you're looking at, uh, say, chain dynamics, well, then you need to go to spin echo. Or if you're looking at molecular vibrations, then you need to be in time of flight. So if the molecular vibration is happening, right, that's fractions of a picosecond molecules vibrating and displacements that are on the order of an angstrom or less. You simply need to make sure that what your experiment is actually telling you matches up to the time and length scale of the physical process that you care about. Okay, that's the trick here, and that's why neutrons occupy a really important spot in the world of polymer dynamics, is because they cover a length scale and a time scale that some of these more accessible techniques simply can't access. So, laboratory based light scattering. Your length scales are much longer. Um, your time scales can cover some of these things, but you know, looking at brilliant measurements, you can see gigahertz process, so tens of picoseconds type processes, but the length scale over which they're occurring is just much longer. So there aren't very many. Uh, so you can see sound velocities, great. You can see diffusion of big particles, great. But if you want to see Small stuff, it just doesn't work. Oh, you have br brilliant in your I do have brilliant downstairs. So, yeah. So if you want to ever measure yeah. sound velocity no, or so so the idea of brilliant light scattering is what is sound? Waves. Waves of what? Physics guy. I mean the thermal guy. <laughs> <laughs> So sound is the density. It is it is fluctuations in the density of atoms between me and you. Okay, so in a class, yeah. So so the idea then is if you have a light scattering technique that is showing you density fluctuations, um, you can see the wavelength, sort of this repeat spacing, the velocity of that density difference propagating through a material. Brilliant scattering is really good at measuring that density fluctuation. Now, if you want to measure sound velocity, it's fantastic. I tend to use it for something called extended depolarized light scattering, which is actually looking more at molecular motions 
and it's kind of an extrapolation out to longer length scales. At the end of the day, the most practical use of sound velocity. All right. So it's pretty rare to have that instrument. Yeah, yeah, there are not many of them around. There's probably one in Ohio. Actually, AFRL and Ohio State wrote that one. Oh, that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I happen to know the, so there's basically one manufacturer for these instruments, Sandicott. Um, and I happen to know that sales guy, like the, the guy that built physically, there's two people that build these instruments in the world. Um, they're they're never sold it a company. Oh, they, they got bought. Company. Yeah. So actually, they got bought by the company they were buying the vibration damping equipment from. So they created this company and then this company called Table Stable, which is just, it builds vibration damping equipment, just bought them so that they would always use their products and it, it, it works for them, I guess. Okay. So the project uh, that, that I was gonna talk about here was how we use inelastic scattering to measure diffusion of acetone inside Nafian membranes. Okay, so this was a project that we were doing with Professor Angelopoulos and Professor Nesenko uh, down in Florida. And the goal here was to understand transport within Nafion uh, because they were intending to use this to see some sort of a color change to detect the presence of acetone or ketones uh, for some kind of a, you know, monitoring or detection device. Um, that wasn't my side of the project. I, I don't really care about it, but uh, it is a practical application. So the idea would be, uh, is anybody diabetic? Know somebody diabetic? Yeah. So ketones is a really big biomarker for control of blood sugar, right? So if you have a high ketone level, it means you had really high blood sugar recently or really low blood sugar, excuse me, recently. And it can just be an indicator. So if you're exhaling ketone molecules, that might be an indicator. Well, fine, but... So terminals. Okay. Ketones is good. Also as an environmental marker, right? So if you've got acetone in the area, the idea being this could be a calorimetric sensor uh, for these kinds of molecules. All right. Now, the idea was as you add these ketone or these, you add some organic acid to this Nafian matrix, and the diffusion of acetone and the water that is generated in the reaction, there's some kind of interesting transport barrier that's happening here. And between using pulse field gradient NMR to measure the dynamics of water or acetone and neutron scattering to measure the dynamics of the acetone we were able to sort of describe that there is a, there's sort of a network structure. So you have these water-filled pockets that have rather high diffusion, local diffusion coefficients. And then the main transport barrier is actually the, the percolation between these pockets, these domains. So Nafion is sort of this heterogeneous molecule. Have you, we've covered this. So it, it's a, Basically, it's Teflon with sulfuric acid, well, basically sulfuric acid groups tethered onto it. Okay, so it forms these regions where the sulfuric acids and any residual water separate into one phase. And then out here, that main backbone just tends to be crystalline or semi crystalline uh, Teflon. I mean, the structure is a little bit unknown, right? No, it's not just been able to. There's no micrograph, like finger showing doesn't really. It is the hypothesized the hypothesis structure of Napion. Yeah. So Napion yeah. is. It, it, yes. So we, we did some SANS measurements, we did some uh, SACS measurements, and essentially we can see that the addition of water, the addition of acetone causes the crystal regions to spread, these water filled or uh, acetone filled regions to swell the sulfuric acid regions. Uh, or sulfonic acid region. And, and at the end of the day, when you start probing the question of how long does it take this water molecule to diffuse this distance, this distance, this distance, this distance, you see a huge drop off in the diffusion coefficient when you start probing length scales larger than the domain size. 
Okay. And so what we were able to do, you know, in Alaska neutron scattering was a rather small part of this study. Um, but what we were able to do was really show that the length scale dependence was important in understanding the transport barriers within the material. Okay. So it's coming from primarily this paper, which is PCCP last year. Uh, we had an earlier paper looking at sort of the first version of this, mostly focusing on the structural side. And yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we were able, pulse field grade NMR was really able to show that the existence of this transport barrier, particularly for water, and that it was less sensitive in the case of acetone. And really the question we had was, where is the vanillic acid going or resource and all, whatever organic acid we decide to add? Where is the acetone water population going? Can the diffusion processes tell us anything about that? And at the end, we were able to sort of conclude that the, the vanillic acid addition really only affected um, the acetone diffusion. And it wasn't likely being exposed to the water because it would have been very reactive otherwise. Uh, and that, you know, there's sort of just physical differences between the interfacial region, the water filled pore, um, and the existence of these transport barriers. Okay, now I was just going to come back to the basic concept of scattering. And so when you do elastic scattering, what you're really looking at is a correlation between the scattered wave vector uh, is accessed by the, the angle of scattering. I had a different slide for this, which I should have used, but the idea here is you observe the angle of scattering, you relate that back to the scattering wave vector, and that can be brought into either a spacing, a particular spacing, or a pair distribution function. And I can tell you about structure. The intensity gives you the pair distribution and the Q gives you the spacing. Perfect. You're plotting intensity versus Q. Exactly. So yeah. this is why we have the expert role. That's his specialty, or one of your specialties. So there's other things that happen though when you do a scattering uh, experiment. It is not a given that the magnitude of the incident wave vector and the scattered wave vector are the same. It is very possible that you will gain or lose momentum in that collision. Now, this maybe isn't happening to most of the particles that hit with thermal or cold neutrons, but a certain percentage of the particles will, will gain or lose energy in the collision. And that means that if you can measure not only the angle of scattering, but the time it takes to travel from the target, the sample to the detector versus an unscattered particle, you can tell something about what the molecule or atom you hit is doing. Okay, so you can reconstruct from a momentum balance what the dynamics are of the, of the atom you hit. All right, so it's a way of coupling structure and dynamics uh, using this. And so, I mean, in, in the like in light scattering, you talk about kind of a Doppler effect. You know? So, like the train, see, you know, it comes in, it shakes the electrons, mm -hmm. and then that thing is moving. So it's like the train whistle going up. Yeah. So the energy is coming up, and that thing really emits the sound. It's a different. Yeah. But in neutrons, it's more complicated. What happens, I guess, when it hits, like, the mechanism for the scattering to happen is so simple. It doesn't just shake an electron. Well, it's not. It's, it's, a collide. it's an elastic collision with the nucleus. So it's different. It's what? kind of different. That's... No, I'd say it's actually more, it's more alike. It's more like the sound analogy okay. than the resonance of an electron, right? So in either event, you have... Does your measurement of the diffusion coefficient of the particle is not necessarily an energy transfer? Like you want to know the KP motion of the thing. Um, okay, so, so so diffusion coefficient implies an assumed physical model um, to to capture that. Okay, but at the end of the day, that's just a model built on top of losing energy, losing or gaining energy. Okay, yeah. 
So, so there, there are two like papers. Like, so, so you go like Zakai makes that huge assumption, right? That everything's a harmonic well, and that that's like a lot. Um, okay. The point here is that you can gain or lose energy. That can be coupled to a momentum transfer, and that captures not just the change in the direction of your scattered particle, but the change in the velocity of the scattered particle. So that means if you if you're trying to detect a change in velocity of the scattered neutron, what you care about is time and distance traveled by the neutron. Okay, so you need neutrons that are all traveling one speed, typically for an inelastic scattering experiment. So if you can get a monochromatic beam of neutrons, anything that arrives faster or slower than the unscattered particles, you know has changed energies. This is why spallation is so useful for some methods. Okay. This is a bunch of stuff, but this is a picture I really like. So let's focus on this side. Um, when I think about inelastic scattering, this is what I'm seeing in my head, is this three-dimensional chart. <laughs> so intensity versus Q is telling you about structure. So if there's no, this axis here is energy transfer, this axis is Q, and this axis is intensity. So this is how many neutrons went into a certain solid angle per time. This is how much energy was transferred in the collision. And this is the new scattering wave vector of the scattered particle. If you're doing a SANS experiment or a diffraction experiment, everything you see is on the intensity Q axis. You are essentially integrating all of the inelastic scattering down into the zero position. And that's all you see is the superposition of the coherent elastic scattering and the incoherent elastic scattering. If you are doing a dynamics experiment, you pick a certain Q vector and you try to assess the energy transfer and you'll see spectra that look like this, some sort of a spread peak function. And it's the spreading of that peak or the existence of new peaks that tell you about the energy transfer at a certain length scale for a process. And so this is telling you about dynamics. This is telling you about the change in velocity of the scattered neutron. So if you know, okay, it's, I have a, a new peak at, you know, let's say one MeV or one, yeah, one MeV, that's some sort of a vibrational motion occurring at one terahertz, let's say. All right. And if you're looking at spreading of the peak, that might be more diffusional motion. Um, but again, it's Q and uh, energy transfer. Okay, so I don't know if anybody's grasping what this is showing, but to me, this is this is everything. All right, this is, <laughs> this is a big problem with that Q and energy are related, right? It's, yes. So it's, the Q kind of changes the kind of energy spectrum too. Absolutely. But anyway, you can ignore. So there, there's a. Uh, this is the reason, actually. It gets to be very dicey here, right? And so what happens is that the, the QE sort of window is not a straight square, right? So getting a Q versus energy chart typically implies some kind of a approximation in that curve. But if you stick in backscattering time of flight, you can actually reconstruct that with sufficient resolution now to get charts like this. Yeah, it's great as long as it works. Yeah, it's good. So uh, there are certain ranges with, within which you can do this. And then what often happens is that the cutoff for this window changes as a function of Q. Okay, so that window where you can access Q and E is not necessarily a clean square like or rectangle like this. It may have some shape. So with neutrons, is an energy transfer activating the nuclei of the material? Like sometimes, the sometimes. Um, so anyway, that's kind of yeah. It like typically it. not it, it. So when you're using neutron radiation, a certain fraction of the neutrons will be absorbed in a nucleus, but. For cold and thermal neutrons, that energy is not very high. 
And so it's not common. You, you definitely have activation. And if you have a susceptible nucleus in your sample, 100%, you're going to get activation. But not typically. So if you go to hot neutrons, okay, you're activating everything. That's kind of the point of the HF uh, hyperreactor is actually to create a huge neutron flux at the core of the reactor. But for thermalized or cold neutrons, yes, you activate the sample, but it's a very small percentage. I mean, you can stick your hand in a neutron. I wouldn't recommend it, but you'll live, right? In a cold neutron beam, you'll live. Yeah, I mean, you'll live. It's, again, not recommended, but... Well, the safety procedures were... Very different in the old days. Yeah, yeah, I've heard this. So... I have heard this. I would not recommend it. Having said that, you will survive. Okay. So I just wanted to talk quickly about some of these different inelastic scattering methods. So really, in my mind, there's there's four different approaches to this. There's the classic triple axis approach, uh, which is sort of the first way that it was done. The time of flight approach for the fastest dynamics, backscattering for dynamics on the nanosecond to tens of picoseconds timeline, and then neutron spin echo, which is for slow dynamics. Okay, so the triple axis instrument is based on a classic reactor design, uh, so a reactor source design. What I was saying at the beginning is this idea. If I'm trying to characterize the change in velocity of a neutron, what I really need are neutrons coming in with a single velocity. I need to then be able to detect the velocity of the scattered neutron, okay? And as, as Professor Bataj was saying, Human energy transfer are coupled. Okay, so what you do is you use a series of analyzer crystals, monochromic. So you use a monochromatizing analyzer crystal. So an analyzer crystal, you have a white beam of neutrons with many different wavelengths, like white light, right? You have different wavelengths of light. I have white neutrons coming at my crystal. This crystal is special, say it's silicon 1 1. It reflects neutrons at a defined angle with a specific energy and only that energy. And that sends monochromatic neutrons at a certain angle off of my analyzer crystal to a sample. Okay, now what do I do? I put another analyzer crystal at a specific scattering weight or a specific angle theta from the incident energy. So I know Q, and then I align that crystal such that it reflects only one energy. And so now I'm the only neutrons I'm detecting in my detector are the neutrons that are scattering with a defined change in energy because I can control the incident energy and the output energy with that analyzer crystal. And so what I'll do is I'll start changing the angle of my detector around that analyzer crystal and changing the angle of the analyzer crystal around my sample and changing the angle of the incident uh, white light neutrons versus the first analyzer crystal. And I can scan incident energy versus output energy versus Q. Three axes, triple axis. This is how you get a white reactor source into a monochromatic neutron beam and then detect only a single wavelength of neutrons coming off of that uh, sample. All right, this was the original version of this. It's brilliant. They got a Nobel Prize. It's a classic method. It's still used today for magnetic systems, hard condensed matter. Uh, and the trick is 94? Oh, 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 this is the Schull. Schull and Brockhaus. Yeah. It's the same as the Bond Hart Hart camera. And uh, Hart was the was head of Brookhaven. But Hart didn't win a Nobel Prize. That's for x rays. Ooh, so neutrons from Nobel Prizes, X-rays, <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Well, they'll they they have to make do with being much, 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 much more useful. Can't explain what this, what shock and whatever did, right? Because it's the same camera for X-rays. It, it could have been he was just dead by the time they gave that Nobel Prize away. He was pretty old. Yeah. He was around. I, I don't, I think there was one other person that they intended to give it to in 94 who was passed away by then. Okay, triple axis. So time of flight 
is a more modern approach that does pretty much the exact same thing as triple axis. So in this case, you put your sample in the middle of a big bank of detectors, okay? And these detectors are covering many angles and they're constantly collecting. And the idea here is that it uses a series of mechanical choppers at the front end of the instrument. So if you can get a stream of monochromatic neutrons, okay, so these neutrons have a single wavelength, they're coming in, at, that means they're coming in at a known velocity. And what you do is you have a series of these choppers and what, what are they doing? They're chopping out the time of the beam coming in. So what you want is a pulse of neutrons coming in periodically, okay? And you want to allow enough space between them such that all the neutrons are detected from the prior pulse and you don't have any pulse overlap. And so your whole goal here is to generate a system where you have monochromatic neutrons coming in as a pulse, 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 pulse at 50 hertz, 20 hertz, 60 hertz, whatever frequency it is you're, you're working with. And when your pulse hits the sample, it will scatter. It will go to a certain angle Q and it will come in at a certain time. And by measuring when the sample comes in, you can back calculate the velocity change. If you know the velocity coming in, if you know the distance, you know the time when it hits, you know the velocity of the scattered neutron. So large changes in velocity correspond to small changes or fast dynamics, okay? More energy is being thrown in. So that change in velocity is something that you can measure with a clock, you know, microseconds. Right. So this is something that you would use for molecular vibrations, um, fast dynamics, sound dynamics, phonons, things like that. All right. Now it gets harder to measure small changes in velocity. And so when you're doing small changes in velocity, you can still do this physically with a technique called backscattering. This is an old fashioned backscattering apparatus uh, based on a reactor source where you use a Doppler, uh, you move this back and forth and you use the time of the backscattering, hit the sample. This is how you monochromatize your beam, your instant beam at a series of different frequencies. And then you collect everything at a single frequency. So you have an analyzer crystal here, everything reflects back to your detector. So you essentially invert the geometry of the triple axis and the time of flight instrument together, and you can detect smaller changes in the, the, the velocity of the scattered neutron. This is done more directly in spallation sources where you use a pulse source. So this is the only source. Number six is the monochromatic. You put your monochromatizing crystal okay. here on the metal floor, right. and then you simply move that back and forth physically. Okay. And that's how you're changing the length because you're basically so scanning like across the velocity. Yeah, it's a monochromator, but it's a it's a variable monochromator. The interferometer. Oh, you're not getting any. No, it's not canceling. Yeah. Okay. All right. They tried to make neutron interferometers. It just doesn't work. It does. It would work if they ever put it in the proper spot, but it wouldn't be very useful. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Uh, you can. You can. You can redesign this entire thing on a pulse source in a much better way. Um, these are huge instruments. These are huge instruments. And so actually I should I should say that here as well. Yeah. If you put this on a continuous source, you have to chop out all of the beam you're not using. So if you think about the, the production of neutrons as a time series, this light is constantly producing photons. But if I only wanted this light to hit me once or 20 times a second for a width, for a pulse width of, you know, 0 0.001 seconds, I'd be throwing away most of the photons produced, right? If I'm chopping it out to just get these little packets of light every 20th of a second that are very narrow in time. That's what you're doing with the neutrons that you produce on a reactor. Most of the neutrons you produce are chopped out. And so you only get these narrow pulses. Now a spallation source 
it's only producing pulses and neutrons because what a spallation source is, it's not a nuclear reactor. It's a hunk of metal or a liquid metal that's being hit with protons at you know, relativistic speeds. And what happens is that those atoms, those heavy metal atoms that it hits, splat, they give off a neutron in their decay. And when you turn off the proton beam, you turn off the neutron radiation. So it's much safer. Um, but, the, but the proton beam is going in pulses. And so it's going to hit a pulse every 20th of a second or 60th of a second or whatever it is. And that means that what you're producing is already in a pulsed structure. And so you're chopping out much less of the total neutrons you produce. And by controlling the energies in that collision, you can control sort of the, the wavelength of the produced neutrons. And then you can thermalize and you can do all of that, but you can tailor all that to the pulse structure you create. It means that your choppers aren't chopping out 99.9% .9 of your product produced neutrons. They're chopping out, they're just cleaning up a pulse that already exists. They're just shaping that pulse uh, sort of forwards and backwards in its structure. But it's a much higher percentage of the produced neutrons you're getting. And so this is where you end up having the question of time averaging of neutron production versus pulse formation. So for dynamics experiments, those pulses are phenomenally useful. Because that's what you want anyway. For small angle scattering, for diffraction, for spin echo, those pulses are really awful because you care about integrated flux on target. If you're just doing a diffraction measurement, you don't care about that time structure. All you've got now is a pulse incident beam that is giving you all kinds of problems because of, yeah, we, all, we don't want to talk about sands with a pulse source. It's just awful. So, all right. So the same applies to this. The same applies here. You can reconstruct this entire thing where the pulse structure is assumed at the front end. And you can get rid of this Doppler piece here altogether. It just can be designed to way to get the, uh, the pulse neutrons from the from the source. All right. And then in polymer dynamics, neutron spin echo has this sort of special place because it can measure slow dynamics, polymer chain dynamics. And so it, slow dynamics are measured or are characterized by small changes in the neutron velocity. So changes that are too fast for us to mechanically clock or to distinguish the time it takes for the incident beam to hit and a scattered beam to hit. Like that time is too fast. We can't catch it. And so how do you how do you do that? How do you figure out the change in velocity when it's too fast to mechanically clock? Well, you embed the velocity in the spin of the neutron. And so what happens is if you polarize the neutron spins at the entry of the detector with a, magnet. with a magnet, right? So they have a, neutrons have a weak magnetic moment, but you can align that in a strong magnetic field. And then you allow the neutron to process through a coil of controlled magnetic field. You flip the spin, you allow it to hit your sample, and then you allow the neutron to pass through an equal and opposite magnetic field. And what should happen when it hits the next flipper is everything should come back into alignment and hit an analyzer that detects the polarization and then you detect the scatter, the intensity. And so if the neutron beam coming through, if everything, so the reason they call it a spin echo is you align the spin, you allow the spin to do its own thing, then it comes back together in resonance at the next detector because it's echoing from when it was all aligned Magnetic field, equal and opposite magnetic field, realign, everything comes out just the way it went in. Anything that doesn't come out changed velocities and it didn't come back to resonance. So it's an echo of the initial spin alignment. All right, so that's how you detect this for very small changes in velocity. And this- That was invented by John Peter, right? I, guess I think Fred uh, Mezai. Really? I, I read somewhere that he was invented. So maybe two there's two there's there's two yeah. critical technologies to this uh -huh. method. One technology was recognition, which is from NMR, 100 percent from NMR. Right. Yeah. The second thing was the creation of this pie flipper. And yeah. that was Mezai yeah. at at um Bruno at Iowa. Okay. And so the, the there were really two enabling technologies here. Right. All right, so getting back to what we did, 
Yeah. We're like five minutes late. Right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, see ya. <laughs> yeah. no, that was pretty good. I mean, I think you guys played a lot of that. I got to yeah. go through some of the analysis tomorrow on Friday. Now. Yeah. So I think that's what okay. So this is this is what it this is what the actual experiments look like for a backscattering instrument. It's the the shape of this peak width that tells you the time scale. So the full width half max is related to the time scale. That gives you. Do you have time to go down and look at your real real sure. machine? Anyone interested in looking at the sound and roads in the fourth floor? I could leave right now. Maybe it's five minutes. Yeah. All right. Let's do that. I'll go through the stuff tomorrow. I don't know why they would ever, but thanks for coming. Yeah, it's very good to come to you. Thank you. Sorry for the interruptions, but oh, no. it's life in the fast lane here. Um, Actually, we need a 